The following is an encore and ad-free presentation of episode 66 of the Read to Lead podcast, a conversation with author Seth Godin. We don't take action because we believe. We believe because we take action. That backwards sentence is at the core of doing work that really matters. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now here's Jeff. Hi there. And thank you for choosing to listen to the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where we talk about not only leadership, but personal development, productivity, marketing, sales, career and jobs, entrepreneurship, and a whole lot more. As I'm preparing to launch an online course, traveling for conferences, and making time for a little bit of R&R, I'm taking just a couple of weeks off from the podcast and from reading, but I didn't want that to mean not taking advantage of the chance to provide you with some great content. And that's exactly what you're in for today. Not because of me, but because of our guest. If you've never heard my conversation with Seth Godin, you need to. Trust me, if you have, I think you'll agree it's worth a re-listen. Now, you might be wondering, well, Jeff, why re-release it? Why not just point me to the original version? Well, you certainly can enjoy that one at any time. But this version has been edited since the original release and I think is better because of it. And, as I mentioned at the outset, it's also ad-free. So let's not waste any more time and get right to it. Seth Godin is the author of 17 bestsellers that have been translated into 35 languages. He's the founder of several companies, a member of the Direct Marketing Hall of Fame, and an influential speaker around the world. He writes about treating people with respect, the changing economy, and ideas that spread. Mostly, he creates projects, many of which he says end up failing. The brand new book, book number 18, is called What to Do When It's Your Turn and It's Always Your Turn. As a listener to the show, if, if you've found this program useful or helpful to you in any way, the person to thank isn't me, but the gentleman on the other end of this call today. Seth, thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving back to me my love for reading. Holy smokes. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that means the world to me. Uh, as you know, lo- writing is a fairly lonely endeavor. Uh, and when you see the work get into the world and and change the path of someone who then turns out to make such a generous impact, I think that that's just touching and moving and important. So thank you. Well, Seth, yesterday I saw a what to do when it's your turn unboxing video. Uh, and, and the creator was thrilled to get five books and not just the three he ordered, by the way. Uh, but he said at one point, and I thought it was a fair question, do I need another Seth Godin book? And so I wanted to ask, what are some of the ways you've set out to make this new book different from not only everything you've done previously, but from any book that has, that has come before, really? You know, there, there are two ways to think about uh, being in the world making stuff, whether it's books or something else. Um, so the Nike model is to say, what we do is make sneakers. How can we make a sneaker that more people want to buy? Uh, a public company needs to figure out new niches and new ways to put more stuff in the world. The other way to do it, Uh, which is the way that I do it and many writers I know do it, is we don't write a book unless we absolutely have to. Um, That the the, Not only is the blank page a little forbidding, but the act of bringing the book to the world is so um, annoying that (laughs) we try to avoid it whenever we can. So I didn't sit down and say, does the world need a Seth Godin book? I sat down and I said, uh, will I be able to sleep if I don't write this book? Mm. Uh, that what I am trying to do with this book, as much as any book I've written, is help people wake up. And with Lynchpin and Icarus, I worked very hard to help people see how the industrial economy is fading away and to help people see the opportunity that they must take. But those are books. And like many people, they don't read books. And so when I found this new format... And I think I'm the first person who's written a book in it Mm. uh, that feels like a magazine that you can read two pages at a time without feeling like a loser. Uh, I said to myself, the world probably does need this format and I have something to say in it. And so I came out of a a happily enforced two-year retirement from writing books to make this thing and have spent the last six months of my life bringing it to the world because 
it is touching people in a way that is waking them up. And the reason I sent that person five instead of three <laughs> is because I desperately want people to give it to other people. Most people discover a book, not in the bookstore, not on Amazon, but they discover it because someone gives it to them. Well, you mentioned wanting to encourage people to, to wake up or to encourage people to change, help them accomplish that. Why is, why is change so hard? Why is waking up so hard for us? Because change involves risk. Change doesn't always work. Risk involves failure. Failure involves death. So change evolutionarily belongs in the same part of our brain as death. And most people, when given the choice, will stick to what they've got, just like most squirrels and most owls and most uh, raccoons will stick to what they've got. That's how we are wired. Now, the thing that separates humans from everybody else is we also have a curiosity uh, instinct. And that is why technology has been evolving. That is why we live indoors now. That is why they invented sushi. Uh, you know, if, if you go to someone who's never eaten sushi, and that's more than a third of the people in the United States to this day, mm. and say, would you like some warm rice with a piece of cold uncooked fish on top? <laughs> they say, well, what's in it for me? I'm not interested in that sort of change. And the difference between sushi and change at work is that Sushi is easy to avoid, and you can live a full life without it. I am not sure that ignoring the end of the industrial age is a good way to live a full life. Well, largely because of technology, we, we easily have uh, more choices, more options, more resources, uh, certainly than any other generation in history. And so would you say as a society, Seth, that we're leveraging that advantage to the fullest, or are we missing opportunities to make an even bigger impact? Oh, we are missing it. I am missing it. Every single day, I am not taking advantage of all the resources that I have. Anytime anyone goes online and watches Justin Bieber or a cat video, they are wasting the magic that has been built of 40 years of the internet. Anytime that we don't uh, generate and contribute a blog post, a suggestion, a podcast, anytime that we let someone suffer in silence and alone as opposed to reaching out to them, uh, I think that we are letting ourselves and the community around us down. Seth, what do you do in, in the moments you realize you're hiding from the work you should be doing? Well, what I try to do most of all is make myself really uncomfortable about it. Okay. The new book is in InDesign, which is a program that replaced... Quark, which is a program that replaced PageMaker, which is a program that replaced Ready, Set, Go. And in 1985, I was a beta tester for Ready, Set, Go. I was really good at Ready, Set, Go. Oh, wow. And every time they make a new one of these programs, I don't want it to succeed and I don't want to learn it. And <laughs> as I've gotten older, it's getting harder and harder. So I had been hiding from InDesign for years and I decided to focus on on the discomfort that I had about that hiding. And the best way to do it was to commit to making a book in it. So there are bits of technology, there are bits of connection, there are bits of risk where I know what it feels like to look them in the eye and hope that they go away. And when I find those, I try to prioritize them, pick the ones that are important and deliberately make myself uncomfortable because I'm ignoring them. Mm. Well, I know uh, one goal for the book, I've heard you say, was to try and, and capture some of the energy you're able to bring to uh, your, your live engagements, your live speaking engagements. Do you feel you achieve that goal with the book? And if so, in, in what ways? You know, the live speaking thing is magical from the point of view of the speaker in that uh, it's a pretty new phenomenon where successful folks come together in a room uh, and allow someone they've never met to come in for an hour and put on a show that may or may not change them. And uh, I have never taken that privilege for granted. What I do know is I can't do more than 30 of them a year, but this book is working 24 hours a day for me in front of people and in countries where I can't go. And so, no, it's not my live uh, experience for me or for them, but based on the feedback I am getting, this book, more than any of the books I've written that have five times as many words in them, is getting under people's skin. Uh, from the cover to the last essay, I think that what I have succeeded in doing, and I'm surprised and delighted, is get under people's skin with something that's going to resonate with them for a long time. 
Well, if you pre-order the book as I did, uh, you, you know this, but Seth did a live call recently for those that pre-ordered the book. And, and one question that, that came out of that discussion was very intriguing uh, to me. And the question was, how do I resolve the idea that I often know I can, but I don't always believe I can? And is this something I should even bother trying to resolve? Yeah, I loved that question. I think that was the best question of the day. <laughs> so l- let's try to parse it a little bit. The rational part of our brain knows uh, that we can do certain things. It knows that we know how to type and that technically we could post a blog. Uh, But the irrational part of our brain, the fear-based part of our brain, says, I don't believe I can do it well. Mm. I don't believe it's my turn. I don't believe I have a right. And so what we often do is have an internal debate. We litigate with ourselves, with the rational part of our brain, trying to get the believing part of our brain to come along, to prove to the other part of our brain. And I'm being very literal here. There are two parts of our brain. I can show you on an MRI that there are two parts here arguing with each other. And I think that's a mistake because we don't take action because we believe. We believe because we take action. And that simple backwards sentence is at the core of doing work that really matters. That you see this when someone goes and does something radical and then two or three people tentatively copy them and then 30 people copy them and then suddenly everyone's doing it. Mm. Well, the reason that it took a few cycles is because seeing really is believing and even more than seeing, doing is believing. So what we have to do if we want to make a difference, do first, believe second. And we can train ourselves to do that. And another thing that came out of that discussion that, that I appreciated was you said you can either present a story to people who want to hear it, or you can change people into people who want to hear it. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? So the people who pre-ordered my book, and thank you, Jeff, for being among them, got 50,000 copies, well, 47,000 copies so far of the mm. book. Those people didn't get a hard sell. There were no retail establishments. There were no fast discounts, exploding offers, and relentless banner (laughs) ads. I just whispered to the people who had been trusting me for 10 years, um, here it is. So I didn't have to change the minds of those people to get them to get the book. Mm -hmm. Now, those people all have a book in their hand that they can share. So they can go to someone with way more force and leverage than I can, and they can say, here, this changed me, maybe it will change you. And that's a different strategy than the marketer, the publisher, going to market and saying, everyone, everyone, you need this, because that doesn't usually work. As a coach, a podcast coach specifically, I I sometimes hear from clients or run into folks who are up against a wall, and they'll say something like, you know, the, the world just doesn't get what I do, and they're on the verge of of giving up thinking that because of that, it makes what they're doing uh, not important or, or less important. How would you respond to them? Well, the first thing I would do is point out that they're really smart to hire you as a podcast coach. <laughs> um, but this, the second thing is that uh, reassurance is overrated. There is no amount of reassurance that is sufficient to get you to believe. Mm. That external reassurance is something that we seek all the time. Uh, Amazon has ruined the lives of countless authors by publishing for all to see reviews from unnamed anonymous critics. Mm. And I have never once met an author who said, I read all my one-star reviews and now I'm a much better writer. (laughs) So three years ago, I stopped reading my Amazon reviews and it was one of the smartest decisions I ever made. Because if someone goes to the trouble of giving you a one-star review, the book wasn't for them. Mm. It's not that the book was bad, it just wasn't for them. And dismissing that, not hating those people, not resenting those people, but just saying it's not for you and permitting yourself to do great work for the people who it is for Mm. is freeing and frightening. And it's frightening because as soon as you realize you don't have to please everyone, the last excuse you have for doing your best work goes away. Well, that begs the question, in my mind, do you handle criticism well? Do you have thick skin yourself, Seth? What was the the tipping point, in other words, that that gave you the courage to to start sharing your ideas so long ago? I I divide criticism into two piles. 
informed criticism that is generous is super rare in my life, and I seek it out at all times, and I rarely find it. This is, you know, Nikki Papadopoulos, my editor at uh, Penguin, uh, who contributes so much value in just one paragraph, saying this part, that part, the other part, try this, try this. This is priceless. Uh, I can't wait to have more of that. Then there's the other kind of criticism, and this is the criticism that comes from the pain of the critic. This is the criticism where someone is airing the problems that they have, not generously trying to help you with the problems that you have. I am terrible at dealing with criticism like this because I have trouble reminding myself that this is not criticism about me. So what we do, what I do, is I insulate myself from that criticism. If you have an ax to grind, I would rather send you to a knife sharpening shop <laughs> rather than my house. <laughs> well, if, if you could uh, wave a magic wand, this is sort of a, a, a big picture question. If you could wave a magic wand, what would you fix first as you, as you look at our world? Can I fix two things? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, I want to fix uh, on the positive side I want people to be thirstier. I want them not hungry because that sort of inv involves hustling and taking more than your fair share, mm. but thirsty as in drinking from the fountain of knowledge, as in eager to learn something so you can contribute more, as in willing to see that you have just been handed this huge pile of resources and we ought to take advantage of them. And I would like to think that my mission over the last bunch of years has been not to quench people's thirst, but to make them thirstier. Uh, and then the second thing, which is at least if not more urgent, is I would like the people who work to tear down our culture and to tear down our society to take responsibility and to own what they are choosing to do with their time and their words and their weapons. Um, because I think it's so easy to blame the other guy and to deny that it's your responsibility when you act in a certain way, whether you are a freedom fighter or a lawyer or something in between, you need to own your actions. And um, unfortunately, the combination of media and politics and commerce makes it too easy to say, I was just doing my job, I was just following orders. Um, and I hope that we can get ever closer to a place where people can say, yeah, I did that and I take responsibility. Because if they do say that, I think that we will all end up acting better. Seth, I've got a, a couple of other questions that aren't directly related to the new book. But before I, I ask those, is there anything else about the book you want to make sure we know about before we move on? You know, a long time ago, I stopped trying to sell books, like 10 years ago, much to, <laughs> much to various publishers' chagrin. If it's not for you, that's totally cool. I hope, though, that even the people who don't read the book will start to think hard about what the book is trying to argue for, which is that if you are stuck on an escalator, it might be time to just walk up the escalator. <laughs> Well, you're creating consistently great content every day. Of that, there's no doubt. Where do you get your inspiration from, Seth? Who influences you, and, and what books are you reading that are having an impact? I, I think the key question to ask somebody uh, along those lines is, where do you get your bad ideas? <laughs> because uh, if you have enough bad ideas, the good ideas take care of themselves. Mm. So the biggest thing that I do that most people don't do is I notice things and talk about them to myself. I talk out loud about uh, things that might be good ideas. And most of the time, they're bad ideas. I just write down the good ones. Uh, and if I have enough bad ideas, I'll be fine. Uh, in terms of what I read, uh, you know, I learned from Tom Peters that 20 bucks is a bargain, even if there's only one good idea on page 17. <laughs> so I have thousands and thousands of books, most of which I bought with my own money, some of which come in the mail, two or three books a day. Um, and it doesn't take that much time. If you stop going to meetings and you stop watching television, you get an enormous amount of free time to drink from this fountain that is being offered to you. And now with the blogosphere and RSS readers, uh, it's even easier and free. Uh, the idea that you can read 100 blog posts in 20 minutes and be smarter than all of your competitors just feels to me like an almost irresistible bargain. <laughs> Indeed. 
Well, your thoughts on uh, the Internet's impact on, on traditional media is well noted, publishing and music and television. I'm curious to know your thoughts on, on the Internet's impact on the future of radio and more specifically the impact of podcasting on radio. All right, so I've blogged about this over the last actually 12 years, and I was right then, and I continue to be right. I'm just a little ahead of myself, so here we go. <laughs> uh, originally, I said there would be citywide Wi-Fi, and once there is, there will be Wi-Fi receivers in your car instead of radio. And once that happens, why on earth would you listen to the local guy screaming at you about the car wash? Um, <laughs> that the magic of radio, real radio, is that it is live and that it is local. But Clear Channel and the rest have made radio not so live and not so local. Mm. We add now the idea that rather than citywide Wi-Fi, everyone has a smartphone. And if you have a smartphone and you have a, a port in your car or Bluetooth, suddenly you don't need your radio. You just need Overcast or some other podcast player. And you can listen to what you want and you can get smarter or more entertained as you drive. Mm. So I think that what is going to happen is that Spectrum, which is a government, meaning us, owned uh, asset that has been given almost for free to radio stations, is about to become worthless. And if Spectrum is worthless because there's a million channels, and there are a million channels now, you can't say, well, we make mediocre radio, but it's the best radio you can find <laughs> because mediocre radio isn't better mm. than listening to Jeff Brown's podcast. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> so, you know, that's where this heads. It's a long tail. It's exactly the same as what's happening to books because of the Kindle. Once the Kindle is the delivery mechanism, there's no advantage to a book coming from Simon & Schuster as opposed to coming from the author herself. Mm. And that means that if anyone can write a book, anyone will, which means most books are terrible. Um, and so there's a new need for curation, a new need for someone to be the mailman and say, read this one, not that one. Mm. Well, the same thing's going to happen to podcasts. The difference, the magic, the power is that podcasts are subscriptions. And that means if one episode is good, the next episode might be good too, which puts a huge bar on the podcaster in terms of keeping the quality up. But it also means once you get a listener, you're more likely to keep a listener, which is even better <laughs> than having a button on the radio. And so I believe that within 10 years, nothing important will be happening in local radio. And almost all the important audio production is going to happen in something that looks like a podcast. And to that, I say, and probably Mark Ramsey does too, amen. <laughs> yes, well, Mark and I, Mark was my platform for the first riff on this, and I, I'm in his debt for giving me that chance. Yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan of his. Well, you've hinted at this, but give us an idea, Seth. 50 years from now, what do you most want to be remembered for? Well, the guy who lived forever and had his hair grow back, of course. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, but my non-quippy answer is <laughs> I don't want to be remembered for what I did. I want to be remembered for what my students taught other people. Well, finally, uh, Seth, I'll ask, what's next on the horizon for you? I know you've just published a book, but if, if I know you as well as I think I do, you're already thinking about or working on the next thing. Is that something you can share? I, I am frantically working on the next thing because... I have no idea what the next thing is. <laughs> and it's, you know, there was a period, a decade or more, where having a book publisher who said, you're only allowed to write one book a year, but when you write it, we will take care of things, was really uh, a thrilling feeling because I had a job <laughs> and I had a cycle and I could think, all right, well, six months from now, I'm going to start writing. What should it be? That's gone. Right? I have book publishers I can work with, but the, all the rules are different. So I don't think of myself as an author. I think of myself as someone who tries to make projects that make a difference. And the number of projects that are available to all of us is approaching infinity, which is hugely scary. And I want to be, I don't want to pick the perfect choice, but I want to pick a good one. And I'm not rushing it, but it better be um, worth it the time of the people who engage with it. And that's a pretty high standard, and I don't want to let it down. Well, Seth, I know you don't say yes to a lot of podcast interviews, so thank you so much for saying yes to this one. We really appreciate your time today, and, and it meant a lot that, that you would come here and share with us about your new book and, 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 and some of your, your experiences and expertise. 
Well, thank you, Jeff. It's you know a fairly thankless job to show up as you do, regularly exposing your ideas and other people's ideas uh, to anyone who wants to listen to them. And if I can encourage that, I, I would like to. Uh, I'm thrilled that you took the time. So thank you. Again, this conversation is a slightly edited version from what was originally episode 66 of the Read to Lead podcast released January 6th, 2015. To dig in further to the resources related to our conversation, visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash Seth Godin. If you heard the last episode, you heard that new feature I'm experimenting with at the end of the episode where we answer a listener question. I'll be bringing that back with my next new episode. If you have a question related to reading, related to books, any of the topics we discuss here on the show, podcasting, or anything else, two ways you can send your question along, either via email to jeff at readtoleadpodcast.com or leave a voicemail by going to readtoleadpodcast.com slash question. Big thanks to Mark G7019, who left a five-star rating and written review in iTunes. Says he was thrilled to come across the podcast and finds it refreshing to listen to the writers speak about their inspirations and stories behind the books and bring the book to life beyond just the words on the page. Thank you very much, Mark. We appreciate your input. Please consider leaving your own rating and written review in either iTunes or Stitcher. I appreciate it so very much. And if you think it five-star worthy, I'll be sure and say thanks in a future episode of the podcast. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Oh, 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 oh,